Good evening. I'm Peggy White, Executive Director of Diablo Regional Arts Association, better known to most as DRAA. We're proud to be the nonprofit partner of the Lesher Center for the Arts. I'm excited to welcome you to Walnut Creek Library Foundation's Live from the Library, Broadway's Golden Age, The Making of an American Art Forum, 1927 to 1964. I'd like to thank our sponsors who have made this event possible. Presenting sponsor, The Simpson Family. Masterpiece sponsors, Kristen and Ray Abraham, Mechanics Bank, Robin Coke Moore, Wrangle and Arthur Wrangle, and Rudney Associates, Eric Rudney. Classic sponsors, Donahue Fitzgerald Attorneys, Cynthia and Mark Jordan, The Safeway Foundation, Cindy and Gordon Baker, Kathleen and John Odney, Donna Robinson and Brian Kredlick, Laurie and Greg Tinfo, contributing sponsors, um, Carol and Ernie Leopold, media and print sponsors, Diablo Magazine, East Bay Times at Minimate Press and Lafayette. Before we start the program, I know many of you are and going to performances at the Lecture Center for the Arts. Great news. Your favorite producers are back with a full season. We can't wait to see you back at the center. I also have the exciting news. d is setting a new standard and we're bringing a new high quality Headliner series starting in um, January of 2022 with Leanne Rhymes, followed by in February by two time Tony Award Brian Stokes, uh, April 29th and 30th, Dance Theater of Harlem, May 16th, 18 year old Joey Alexander, the youngest jazz artist to ever be nominated by a Grammy, and then June 25th, Tony Award winner Laura Bonatti. We can't wait to have you back at the Leisure Center to see these programs and tickets will be available in November. Um, it's so exciting tonight to have this program when Broadway's opening, how perfect is this topic tonight? I'm pleased to welcome tonight's presenter, professional actor, writer, and director, Robert, Rob Seidelman. Rob studied at Williams College and ACT in San Francisco. We earned MFA in 2004. Rob has acted, directed, and written professionally and self worked in various creative capacities with ACT, Berkeley Rep, and Berkeley Playhouse, among others. He co-founded a performing arts school in the Antioch Unified School District and has won three theater programs at high schools across the Bay Area. His original musical, based on Milton's epic poem Paradise, Lost, premiered at the New York Music Theater Festival in 2008. Rob lives in Walnut Creek with his wife, two daughters, two dogs, and a cat, all of whom have Shakespearean names, except his wife. From Showbuck to Fiddler on the Roof, Rob will take us from the birth of American musical theater through the major works that established the genre and a lively discussion on what makes the musical a quintessential American art form. Following his outstanding presentation, we have a brief Q&A you can submit your questions in the QEA box below your screen at any time during the program. If you enjoy tonight's program, please consider making a donation to the wonderful Walnut Creek Library Foundation. You can make the donation on their website or you can click on the link in the chat box. Without further ado, please welcome Rob Saddleman. Hi, thank you very much, Peggy. Um, and thank you to the DRAA uh, for all the work you're doing um, in the arts in the region and everyone who supports the arts in the region. Um, very, uh, very much um, appreciated for everything that you do. And my daughter just decided to walk in. <laughs> anyway, folks, I am so thrilled to be here. Thank you uh, to the Walnut Creek Library for, um, for making this event possible. Uh, lofty goal tonight, but I hope I can shed a little bit of light on um, on Broadway for you. Uh, certainly this is born out of my teaching and also just um, under current uh, conditions, I started to acutely miss uh, theater and started having more discussions with folks and um, thinking about theater a lot. And this couldn't have come along at a better time for me uh, personally to just re-engage with, uh, with the art form and, and share that with you and hopefully Give you some nuggets. Let um, me go ahead and share my screen with you now. Hopefully, everyone can see that. So, um, I talked specifically about 1927 to 1964 uh, for a particular reason. Um, 
and we'll get into that. But I find it useful to frame uh, this discussion uh, in by giving a little bit of uh, a prologue uh, from significant time beforehand. Um, thinking first about what makes theater so special and theater itself is born out of song. It's born out of music. So tragedy uh, literally means goat song in, uh, from the ancient Greek. And the thought here is that the word uh, comes from, or in the form comes from a uh, call and response religious ritual around sacrifice, which sort of makes sense uh, if, you, if you think about it. So uh, musical, well, theater is born out of music and musical theater brings the two back together in a very unique way way. When we talk about um, what makes musical theater separate and um, from theater as a whole, because there is music in theater all the way through history, um, there's a very specific set of criteria that I'm looking at. But before we get there, I think that that link to the religious uh, component of and ritualistic component of the human experience is super important that uh theater brings out the nobility in humanity but it also brings out the profanity so i heard this image uh the teacher gave me this image of a human being as sort of a connector between the lofty and uh, the mundane. And that is how I think the best theater operates. It acknowledges both what is noble and what is um, not so noble in in all of us. And everything comes together in in this particular art form. Um, going to the Greek drama for a second as the as the uh, wellspring of this, you have the tragedy, which tends to be all about uh, lofty ideas, form, and that sort. You have comedy, which is form of a different sort. It's playing on form. And then the very much lesser known third tertiary genre of satyr plays, which are incredibly ribald and body. And um, all three of those uh, concepts you'll see uh, come up again. So now with that background set, let's think about where musical theater specifically begins. As I mentioned, present in Greek, Roman, Shakespearean Renaissance, we, we certainly have music in theater, but where does musical theater begin and what does what distinguishes that? So I think musical theater comes together out of an alchemy of three forms, opera, operetta, and vaudeville music hall. Um, we're going to get into what those three components bring to the genre and how and the catalyst for that alchemy in the next little bit. So opera, opera gives us a visceral experience, music, emotion, spectacle, all coming together for an emotional impact. Um, Wagner's idea of um, Gesamtkunstwerk uh, is really central to this, and Wagner, I think, is one of the um, one of the early earliest uh, antecedents of the modern musical. Because we're talking about a total artwork, he saw this unification of form, of music, of dance, of story, all to combine together in a complete experience, and that. Um, what is uh, was a unique idea at the time, and I think certainly took over and has become dominant. Um, we do have comedic and dramatic uh, operas. I would say certainly that the, as far as opera goes, the dramatic is more um, is is more powerful and potent in in this al uh, alchemical uh, reaction. Operetta gives us uh, a form, uh, a, uh, a very particular structure and um, intellectual wit, an intellectual uh, com uh, comedy that um, 
is flows into the musical theater tradition. Gilbert and Sullivan, of course, are the you know the headliners from this uh, from this form. Although we certainly saw in uh, American operetta, which I'm not terribly well versed in, but Victor Herbert and and um, others, the Gay Divorcee and and whatnot, it's very formal and witty and stiff upper lip and and all of that. Um, and uh, but it also can be incredibly funny and incredibly poignant as well. Music Hall and vaudeville fill out the um, the rest of this equation. Um, many of you uh, might be familiar at least with the the idea of vaudeville. Um, certainly, many of our earliest uh, television radio uh, stars come from that vaudeville um, tradition. I did want to take a moment, however. Uh, and share a bit of music hall because that is the British uh, kind of equivalent um, and certainly um, less well known on this side of the pond, as it were. Uh, I found this amazing rendition of of uh, or a clip of a um, of a British um, music hall performer that I wanted to share, Charlie Coburn. <laughs> I just got here to Paris from the sunny southern shore. I knew Monte Carlo with just to ring me with the ring. Then fortune smiled upon me as she never smiled before. And I now got lots of money, I would yet. Yet I now got lots of rider, I would yet. And I walked along the wide wood on an independent air. Could hear the girls' prayer. He must be a millionaire. Could hear them sigh and wish that I would see them wake the other eye. But a man who broke the back at Monte Carlo. And I walked along the wide I patronized the table at the Monte Carlo Hill, still he hadn't got a shoe, but a Christian or a Jew. I did go to Paris for the chance the man was dead, who the darling of my heart, what can I do? When with twenty tongues she swears that she's through. Now we did swear that that art I think this one in pitch. And I hope you'll be good enough to follow me in the same language, don't you? Mind you, none of you are not fooled, and Sam, Terry, Ann, or no one of you at what? We said the real stuff. Can't you, Ballad, who was with all the Nordic Humble Wild? You must deal to live with a girl, or three, tell me the man. You're not by in the door, you print it on, but I'm not going to go to the beach with a lot of bank of both the car, Lord, and your very best friend. And that's your friend, Lord. My dear, that's it. So what we uh, see from the uh, from British Music Hall in vaudeville is the rise of acts, uh, different personalities, um, stars, uh, celebrity culture, um, and these acts become famous uh, in two ways. Um, first because of the Industrial Revolution. And that's super important to, to mention here. If you look at where uh, the railroad network was in 1870 uh, up through eight, and then in 1890, you can see a tremendous expansion of the transportation network. And um, being that as it was, folks had to, these weren't you know simple one day trips. If they were going cross country or even uh, in, you know interregionally, they had stopovers and these stopovers would be at stations that would build hotels next door. And in order to entice a person to one hotel over another, you would have um, a theater inside and that theater would bring entertainment in and thus the vaudeville circuits born uh, a similar um, circuit in uh, for African-American performers called the Chitlin circuit comes into existence uh, in counter programming as well. And um, each of these towns, have different levels of cachet and different um, reputations. And that's where uh, New York certainly becomes uh, prominent in, in all of this. And playing at the Palace becomes a thing. The Palace Theater in New York becomes a huge vaudeville hall. Um, additionally, folks, because of the Industrial Revolution, have leisure time. They have the ability to, to relax 
They don't have to work a 20 hour work day. Um, and they have a little bit of extra cash to spend to go see uh, vaudeville. Second piece to think about is that while radio was still a ways off, sheet music and uh, was the main mode of, of communicating different songs. So the same network that's bringing these stars to different places is also bringing um, sheet music salesmen to different places, selling the, the sheet music. And uh, so folks are able to communicate, oh yeah, I saw this amazing show and this amazing performer uh, and uh, here's what their, their song was like. And oh, you know, so it's an early way of communicating um, uh, the content and getting people excited about uh, different um, different performers. So as I mentioned, we have you know different circuits. The Orpheum circuit, which um, <laughs> which was bought by it was run by Martin Beck and bought by RKO, became movie theaters. Um, the Pantages, uh, run and owned by the eponymous Alexander Pantages. That's why you see Orpheum theaters and Pantages theaters everywhere. And I mentioned the the Chitlin circuit. Um, it's also where we get the idea of the small medium and big time uh, in all of this. And so many amazing performers come out of it. Abbott Costello, Andrew Sisters, Fred Astaire, uh, truly form the basis of early uh, radio, television, and, and movie celebrity culture uh, and entertainment. So we're gonna zoom in now on New York because that really did become the destination. And within that, uh, industrial revolution and the transportation boom that I was mentioning. Um, there's a mini, a mini major boom in New York City. The uh, subway, which I'm also a ridiculous fanatic for, uh, was initially built. If you look at the uh, 1904 map, there's this kind of jog over on 42nd Street uh, from Grand Central Depot over to the west side. Not really much noted there. And then we see that in 1924, um, that that this becomes Times Square because of the confluence of the subway, and that uh, confluence only grows more and more as more lines are added, which you can see in, in 1939 as well. Folks start meeting in Times Square. It becomes a natural junction point for people to meet. Um, from the city and anyone who's lived in the city knows you never meet at someone's house you always meet out and so Times square happened to sit at the confluence of the confluence uh and provided uh, a backdrop for um, a bunch of theaters to spring up a theater district within that folks were also in vaudeville developing a taste not only for certain acts but for longer narratives so it wasn't enough to see will rogers do his roping uh, his lassoing act and, and his witty repartee they wanted to see more. They wanted story. They wanted content. And so the uh, vaudeville circuit started developing long, uh, elongated narratives, uh, multi multi scene um, playlets and musical numbers with multiple pieces that ended up developing into what we think of as a, a cohesive, coherent musical, um, combining with uh, operetta, opera, in the catalyst of the Industrial Revolution post-Civil uh, War uh, America with uh, increased leisure time and uh, more of a, a modern approach to, um, to the work. So that very quickly brings us to the Golden Age. The Golden Age takes a, a, a long form story with a cohesive music structure and and combines it together and i would uh, that really starts with showboat but the the perfection of the form doesn't really uh come until oklahoma and i'll talk about that in a second so i want to highlight these first three because showboat really to me uh speaks to a vaudeville heritage and then Board game best, well, I'll get to it in a second, but sh let's start with the show about vaudeville heritage, but it's a really, it's a cohesive vaudeville. It essentially takes um, what had been the tradition, Kern and Hammerstein, this is um, Oscar's dad. Uh, well, he's also Oscar, but it's Oscar Hammerstein, the second dad. Um, 
and uh, it brings it um, to a, a cohesive story. And so I want to show you a little bit of Showboat. Kern and Hammerstein wrote music lyrics or lyrics music, and then um, Edna Ferber uh, from the uh, the Algonquin Roundtable wrote the book. This is from the revival uh, in 1995. It's just like her grandpa, giving the whole show away for nothing. vaudeville here that there is no link between the choreographic elements of that song and the 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 plot um and that is why the the, the golden age begins with show but it certainly doesn't isn't perfected um because there's still a, a, a in sense they're hitting a pause button saying okay i'm gonna Stop the story for a second. And I'm going to show you this really cool dance where everyone gets in the line and does it. And Susan Stroman captures that magic in the revival really well. And it is it is magical. Don't get me wrong. It's not like it's a, a bad thing, but it's a very distinct 
uh, style and choice that was pre uh, pre golden age. The other pre proto golden age piece that I want to bring up because it really calls in opera is Porgy and Bess. Um, Porgy and Bess not only calls in opera, actually, and Showboat does this as well. They're bringing in elements of um, I'd say you know controversial elements. Both shows deal with racism um, at a time. 1927, 35, not exactly, you know, uh, easy pickings as far as like uh, gaining popular audience uh, to tackle racism. But Porgy and Bess takes it one step, I think, beyond Showboat, um, both in terms of its uh, virtuosity, but also in terms of bringing um, uh, African American performers, Black performers, on stage in a, um, you know, uh, in a very uh, powerful and uh, uh, meaningful way. Um, and I am sharing the revival here as well, because it's got Audra McDonald singing, and I'm sorry, but you really can't beat that. So here you go. <laughs> definitely see a heavier operatic uh, um, influence on that, not to mention um, the Gershwin's uh, real um, attempt to at least connect with um, authentic uh, sort of uh, scales and um, style, musical stylings in um, African-American communities. So that, that was hugely important with Porgy and Bess. We're still seeing a separation of, um, and Hayward actually, uh, I'm glad I put a note in there, doesn't get enough 
um, enough credit for, for the work uh, done on the show as well um, for the for the for the book. Um, this all came together, and I think the the kind of shining example of like this is the golden age show that starts um, by which everything else is measured is Oklahoma, because Oklahoma brings dance in as a narrative uh, element by virtue of the choreography of Agnes DeMille. Um, DeMille's work on the show in, um, in the uh, choreography really used the dance to propel the story forward, most notably in the Dream Ballet, but also um, throughout the choreographic work done in all of the numbers um, adds more plot, more nuance that um, than uh, shows had previously known. Um, DeMille's uh, balletic background really uh, helped with this and actually um, was probably one of the, the, big, one of the biggest uh, threads of, through, of choreography through the Golden Age. Now, I want to take a moment um, to show you the most recent revival of Oklahoma, which is actually coming to um, Broadway SF uh, this uh, season, I believe. And it does sort of violates all of the golden age rules. So we're gonna take a step outside because I want, one of the things that's challenging about talking about musical theater is we talk about um, a lot of these things seem like old hat and they weren't. And one of the things that we, uh, that I picked up in, in, a, in one of my classes was this idea of the shock of the new, right? What was it like to sit in uh, an audience uh, and see Oklahoma in 1943, which my grandmother and grandfather did on, I believe, their first date for five cents in the balcony. Um, what was it like to see that for the first time and have never experienced anything like it? Uh, I think that even though it doesn't necessarily capture all of the choreographic, um, you know, sweeping revol uh, revolutions that, that Agnes DeMille um, brought to the genre, I think that you can get a sense of sort of what it was the shock of what seeing Oklahoma was like for the first time in the latest revival. And that's what's really exciting about it. Yeah, so much a question of not knowing what to do. I know this right and wrong. I hear the stories and I reckon they are true about how girls are put upon the men. I know I must have fallen to the pit, but when I'm with the sinner, I forget.
I think it's important when we um, talk about musical theater, especially Golden Age, it tends to have this um, veneer or patina of corniness attached to it or uh, something to that effect. And what oh, that the revival of Oklahoma really does for me um, is it reminds me that it it doesn't have to be those things and it isn't naturally those things. It isn't innately that thing. Uh, so I want, I'm want i going to pin that and I want to finish talking about choreography for a second before I go back. So out of the DeMille tradition, uh, we see uh, a real like flourishing of choreography in uh, as a storytelling element in, um, in the golden age. Uh, Jerome Robbins is another one, probably uh, really culminating uh, choreographically in West Side Story, even though I kind of don't consider that to be a golden age, and I'll explain that later. But it's certainly the choreographic, uh, the use of choreography to tell a story is uh, paramount in that in that piece. You get um, an athleticism with Michael Kidd, uh, with his work with Guys and Dolls, um, and Where's Charlie and Little Abner. And of course, um, Bob Fosse uh, bringing in a, uh, a slink <laughs> a slinkiness um, to the work. I used to be much more, um, I don't know, uh, enthusiastic about about Bob Fosse uh, until I've been reevaluating sort of the 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 pantheon of uh, that we place folks in, and honestly, um, his behavior and the way he treated uh, people, uh, his dancers and uh, folks, it sort of diminishes him greatly in my in my um, uh, perspective. Uh, actually, funny story about Jerome Robbins, speaking of um, <laughs> of how well one is liked, there is a story about him um, giving notes uh, out of town on a show and um, backing ever closer to the edge of the stage as he's giving his notes to his actors upstage. And none of the actors conveniently mentioning to him uh, that he was about to fall off the stage and till he fell off the stage. Um, so be careful when you aren't kind to your to your cast and crew. Um, there's no doubt that these these four uh, in particular are uh, just have made amazing contributions to to choreographic storytelling. And certainly, um, I think Jerome Robbins and Bob Fosse usher us out of the golden age and into what com what follows um, uh, specifically. So let's think about um, the the structure, the classic structure of a of a, of a golden age musical, because this is a pretty a pretty key way for for figuring out if you're watching one. Um, there is a primary plot. I shouldn't say it's primary because it's not always primary, but there is a romantic plot. Um, Lori and Curly. Guy and Sarah, Anna and the King, um, and then there is a a B plot that revolves mostly around a another kind of a counterpointal relationship: Nathan and Adelaide from Guys and Dolls, or Liesel and Rolf from um, from Sound of Music. And these these plots these um lo are usually love stories that are told in counterpoint to each other to um, bring out different elements of of both um, the restraint of the captain and Maria versus the youth and 
impetuosity of Liesl and Rolf. Rolf, I really didn't mean to use uh, Sound of Music as that example because I think Liesl and Rolf are a little uh, creepy, but that's okay. Um, you also then have a uh, comedic relief. Um, you have Max from The Sound of Music, Nicely Nicely uh, from Guys and Dolls. He's thanked Danny Rock and the Boat. And I have to mention here, because it's too cool, is um, Stubby K, who played Nicely Nicely in, in the movie, the um, Broadway actor from, from the era. He used to go into my grandpa's um, camera shop in, in New York, and he would stand back to back with him and say, you and me, Julie, we're like bookends, because they were both kind of shaped the same. Uh, so I always think about that whenever I see, uh, whenever I see Stubby K. Um, there is always a villain, a quote unquote villain who is thwarted. And I want to touch on the use of villain, especially when it comes to Judd. But Judd and Big Julie are, are um, good examples of that. There's always an 11 o'clock number to wake the audience up. People forget that these musicals are long. Um, you know, a Broadway Golden Age musical is generally a little somewhere in the three hour range so you, when, the 11 o'clock number is, is aptly named it literally came around 11 o'clock and it was a chance to wake people up for the finale um the closest in sort of modern um in a modern experience if you're not going to go watch a musical itself you want to see some great musical theater structure watch the south park movie bigger longer and uncut it is made a with to fit a perfect musical theater uh golden age structure um and it's uh, it's quite entertaining to boot so i wanted to 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 circle back to this idea of what defines golden age musicals um because we have this idea of oklahoma um or you know take uh south pacific i'm as corny as kansas in august and that's been perpetuated by the kind of onslaught of youth productions of of these shows, uh, frankly. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with with youth doing these shows. I mean, I, I got my start doing doing these shows. My first show as a 12 year old was Oklahoma, and it was great. Um, but it takes out a lot in order to make these shows palatable for a for kids to perform. It, kind of takes out some of the some of the complications uh in 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 the piece so you know to take judd as a as an example uh from from oklahoma you have a situation where um judd asks lori to the dance she says yes she changes her mind and ditches him and then he he's angry about it and he gets killed sorry spoiler he gets killed and then laurie and curly get married and they and they go off it it's a problem like the show is problematic but nobody remembers or see, or mentions that i mean liesel and rolf seeing well seeing 15 going on 17 i guess you could say at the time not so much of a of an issue but um but you know it's uh, certainly um, now uh, a problem. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, doing a music, musical like Sound of Music is is uh, a problem overall. With uh, you know, with uh, having um, Captain Von Trapp as a hero. Um, so we have this idea, like I said, that these uh, these pieces sort of um, exist in this kind of time capsule and they're they're encased in amber and they're and they're holy but the work the great thing about musical theater when it works well is when it is um interpreted in a way that reflects um a, a change in the time and you think about uh what the revival of oklahoma that you just saw a snippet of does um you can see that the power in that um they've been making strides with that overall it used to be that you couldn't, for example, touch a single uh, choreographic element to change it in West Side Story or in any Jerome Robbins piece without express permission from the estate, which you wouldn't get. And now it's certainly uh, been fairly reinterpreted um, 
by um, Ivo Van Hove, and I'm sure in the new movie that's coming out soon. Um, the fact is that these are ambiguous works. They're left up and meant to be interpreted and chewed on and thought about. Everything from talking about uh, challenging issues like racism, all the way to the nature of, of heroism and who we think the good people are. If you take a look at Oklahoma as an example, those folks are a generation away from the Joes in, um, in uh, Grapes of Wrath. What is going to happen would have been foremost on an audience's mind in uh, 1943. Uh, it might be a little bit lost in the sands of history now, um, but it uh, certainly was very present then. Um, my, my cousin just reminded me that they're, um, they have sort of fixed this problem of uh, the, the, let's say the watering down of the shows by uh, adding a lot of junior versions to, to help make more kid-friendly uh, pieces. So when does the golden age end? The golden age ends in 1964. Um, and I know that Midnight Cowboy is not from 1964, but um, the golden age ends in 1964, specifically, I think, because of two shows, Fiddler on the Roof and Cabaret. Fiddler on the Roof, because it um, ends on a note of ambiguity. Like, there's no attempt to wrap that show up with a, a, a finale the way that Oklahoma did, for example. Um, you see the protagonist, Tevya, and his family walking, walking, and walking, leaving their home, um, and bringing the fiddler with them in maybe a hopeful gesture, but certainly not a, a settled one. And then it fades. And that really, to me, is emblematic of, of what, of what um, was going on in, in the country um, as well. The second uh, show that, that really turned, um, turned the, the age on its head was Cabaret. Uh, Kander Neb took a, a vaudeville-esque form called the Cabaret, and they used it to break down a golden age musical and to distill it and to, they basically went from a modernist work to a postmodernist work um, in, that, in that moment. And that ends very darkly. Um, it's a story of pre-World War II Berlin. Um, so you know where that goes. I mean, <laughs> there's no secret what happens to the Titanic. And so, um, so you have those two in the 1964 season that really, it's not to say that nothing golden age comes after it, but that certainly is the, I'd say the death knell or the the end of like the dom the predominance of it. Um, I always like to to bring up the 1969 Academy Award uh, awards because it really shows the whole thing kind of blow, uh, blown out a little bit. Um, Hello Dolly, the movie of Hello Dolly with Robert, Barbara Streisand and Walter Matthau was up against Midnight Cowboy. And if you think about the world in 1969. And you're thinking about how Hello Dolly and Midnight Cowboy fit into that world together. I mean, it's just it's just a little uh, dissonant. I mean, it's hard to it's kind of hard to wrap your head around the world. Things had progressed and had changed so much. Um, women's rights, uh, Vietnam War, all of those um, elements couldn't be ignored by by theater even by commercial theater anymore and and that um and obviously by Holly, hollywood wasn't trying to ignore it but i think in a lot of ways theater was so um that's certainly not to say like i said that um the golden age uh form doesn't still exist it still does it's, it's used as a tool in a growing tool uh tool chest and so to think about where we go from, from there and wh what happens after the, the golden age, 
is, um, you know, it's not like everything fell apart. I think it, it, it grew in really interesting ways. Like I said, I don't really consider West Side Story to be a golden age musical because I do believe, I mean, it doesn't end on a, on a happy note the way that I mentioned um, golden age musicals tend to. So it's not a traditional piece. It's also very much more um, dance driven than the traditional uh, golden age musical. Uh, I consider that to be a, a musical drama. I consider that the form split even further. There's a lot of people who call golden age musicals musical comedy um, because in, in the more in the Shakespearean sense of, of a comedy where things kind of get wrapped up, even if they don't like Twelfth Night or, um, or Midsummer, where it doesn't quite feel right, but it's kind of tied with a bow. Um, Sweeney Todd, uh, you get musical horror coming out of that, which has produced some really interesting um, offshoots like Bat Boy and and other uh, um, off kilter pieces. You have um, Angela Weber's work with Sam and the Opera, which obviously is uh, a callback to the operetta, but also to more um, what I call musical opera, where it's almost completely sung through um, and uh, almost more about that that feeling versus uh, intellectual content. Um, and then we have rock musicals and rock opera, which are becoming more and more, um, more and more popular. Last but not least, uh, of course, to, uh, leave out the elephant in the room, uh, <laughs> would be, would be silly. Certainly we've seen a lot of, uh, um, you know, a lot of talk and a lot of, um, people, have, I mean, almost everybody in, uh, seems has found a way to, to get to Hamilton and Hamilton, uh, pulls on all of these threads in various combinations because Lynn, you know, is very much conscious of this same sort of um, history. And then he also ties in um, pop, rock, and, and, and rap, and hip hop to, to bring all of these together, to, to knit uh, them together. What we're seeing in that, and I think I'm most excited about, is a greater inclusion of um, a variety of stories um, told by, by different folks. There was there is, I should say, a, a perception. I mean, the fact that Broadway is known as the Great White Way was not only because it was electrified, but because it was thought to be a particular, um, you know, an exclusive club for, uh, for folks uh, that, um, for, for white people, frankly. So seeing that, uh, that change, uh, which it didn't start with Hamilton, but certainly that was uh, that is a, a sea change moment. I think we have an opportunity not to, uh, and then also to uh, mention different different abilities. You saw that the um, the actress who played Ado Annie is wheelchair bound in the revival of Oklahoma. She's doing amazing work in in that area. We're also seeing um, if you had a chance to see the uh, Death West version of. Um, or revival of Spring Awakening. That's another one um, that that came out that just, and a Big River as well that really pushed forward inclusion in the arts. So a lot to look forward to, a lot of innovation, a lot of um, of change. So that's a brief overview. I feel like I'm gonna look back and say that I've left out a bunch of things, which I have, but. I will also want to leave some time for questions, which I see coming up. And um, thank you all so much for uh, for your time so far tonight. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, hey, Peggy. Yes, um, I'm here. <laughs> okay. So I'm just I'm just looking at these. I'm looking the at these at these comments. Oh, the the so uh, so Diana mentioned. Um, so I'm gonna hop into the this before we get into the 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 questions here because I think uh, you know Diana made a really important point about the social implications and relevance of of showboat. Um, yes, it, it told a cohesive story. It was instrumental in bringing social issues to the forefront. Um, and Diana, I mean, you did both these shows 
on the West End, I certainly <laughs> would love to hear about your experience um, with that. Um, so, but yes, uh, I don't, I'm not um, trying to uh, to diminish the the the, the show um, or the the qual the um, the importance of showboat in any of this. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Peggy. <laughs> No, first of all, um, Rob, what an outstanding presentation. It was so thought provoking. So I enjoyed every second of it. And I'm really glad we have some time for some questions and answers. I know we're going to some wonderful answers from you. So um, the first one is how has the pandemic impacted new musical theater development? Um, so, I mean, it's been a challenge. I've seen a lot of my friends uh, who are still working. Um, in the in the business have to do a lot to to make ends meet i have um one friend uh who actually went and built up uh, or built a, a winery um so <laughs> he's doing that now and another who moved down to to uh, uh to georgia to to do some work down there the um for example but what did come out of this is that streaming services gained acceptance um, as, as uh, venues for showing musicals. So we got Hamilton on Disney Plus, we got, um, we got Come From Away on Apple TV, um, to mention a couple that just came to mind off the top of my head. It's exposing musical theater to more audiences. And therefore, what they've actually found is that it is increasing excitement to go see these live. And so, that um, really excites me because before the the musical was uh, was becoming such a a closed shop. Like it was, I mean, tickets are still really expensive. Don't get me wrong, but with tickets being expensive and you couldn't see it anywhere except the occasional great performances on on PBS. Now there's a little bit more equity of access, which I think bodes really well. That's that's fantastic. Um, uh, another great question, why does singer and dancers, actresses like Shirley Temple, how do they fall into this era? And how do they contribute to the genre? Oh, sure, gosh. Um, <laughs> I, I wish that I could uh, be, speak more eloquently about, about the, um, the individual uh, performers. I would say that, you know, you get the, the creation of, um, or I the creation, the invention of, or the establishment of the diva, the, the prima donna musical theater prima donna with uh, folks like Ethel Merman, and I think her her celebrity on stage, you can see that lineage come down. You can also see like the um, kind of counterpoint to Ethel Merman, the Mary Martin um, uh, lineage come down as well through like uh, folks like Kelly O'Hara um, into into the present and the present day, and I think the celebrity culture around seeing those uh you know specific performers was um was really strong and does contribute to what we see today with like uh revivals of the revival of music man with hugh jackman or um you know, and sutton foster and i think um then on top of that you have some folks who become muses to their um to their particular uh uh, composer, lyricist, um, uh, folks. I'm, I'm thinking again of, you know, um, Ethel Merman and Irving Berlin with, uh, and creating shows around her, like Annie Get Your Gun, um, and things like that. So I think there's a, a strong, uh, connection. I haven't spent as much time with individual performers because it's really, that's one of the frustrating pieces about it. You can't see folks from the originals in a lot of cases. That's great. So does Hamilton fit in the genre and is it part of the new genre? And what is the new genre? <laughs> it's a... I, I don't, um, I, you know, I think it's always easier to look back and define an era um, than, to, than to define what we're living in the present. Um, Cause I think we finished, so after the golden age, um, I consider that we went up through um, basically from to give a brief overview from 64 until 97, I consider it to be post golden age, um, which by which I mean also postmodern, where um, it's really playing with form as 
so that's where like Tander and Ab and Sondheim um, and, and, and Lloyd Webber come in where they're like, they're taking an audience's idea of a musical or of a cabaret or of um, a burlesque in the case of Chicago and they're using that to tell a story. So that I, that's the postmodern era. And that really ends, to my mind, with Rent um, in 97. And from there, I can say from 97, from Rent until, um, until it was 20, you know, 25 years, is sort of the, the generational piece of this, um, until Hamilton really, to be another um, era. And I'm still working that one out, but it's post postmodern. <laughs> Is what I would say. Um, what we're into now is going to be about telling other people's stories, or telling stories from all perspectives. In, it's an era of inclusive art. Um, it's very exciting to learn about stories from and hear about stories that we already know from people's perspectives who we haven't heard before, and hear stories from new stories that we hadn't heard from people who hadn't had voices before. Um, I'm, so I'm very excited for that. Uh, to happen. That's my prediction. That's terrific. I hope it happens too. <laughs> what themes or topics do you think will be performed in future musicals? And will musicals continue to be popular? Gosh, everyone, whenever everyone pre predicts the end of uh, musical theater, <laughs> um, it, it never, it never turns out. Um, I think, I think it's too um, primal within us as not only as people, but I think it's part of the American identity. And I, I, I probably perhaps didn't touch on, on that piece enough that, that if you look at sort of the way we tell our stories, I, I like what actually with Susan wrote here, the Howard Zinn era, because if you look at the way we tell our, we used to tell our history, it looks a lot more like the original Oklahoma, where we don't, re like things happen and we acknowledge that they happen, like Curly killed Judd, but we don't really acknowledge it in a, in a meaningful way and now potentially moving into an idea that no we're going to own all of our history and we're going to actually try to embrace it and like take ownership and, and of it and and find power in in moving forward from that um so i think that's you know where where we're um we're headed because i, I don't think that um america can is going to let is going to let the genre go i just don't see it happening well, I certainly hope not. I mean, that would just, it brings such joy. So I hope it, it keeps, we keep it moving forward and maybe it, come, it evolves and there's a renaissance of it. Yes, I hope so. What do you think of the trend to create musicals based on the live musician artists, for example, Jersey Boys, the Tina Turner musical, Beautiful, and the Donner Summer musical? Oh, <laughs> who asked that question? I hope that, uh, um, I'm, okay, so Jukebox musicals, uh, that's a, so that's another unfortunate trend that that arrived in the post golden age, um, the jukebox musicals and um, revivals, because tickets got so expensive that when people are going to to um, to the theater, they wanted a sure thing. They wanted to know that they were going to enjoy something, which is why I think that streaming musicals are going to be um, on on streaming services is going to be so powerful for ticket sales. Um, so. To go back to the question, though, it's hit or miss, and mostly miss um, for me. Um, I think that when you take a look at uh, musicals, the, the, that genre is is there's a lot of different little sub tendrils within that. So, um, but uh, to just take the genre as a whole. The music of, say, a Tina Turner or the, uh, um, you know, Alanis Morissette or John Lennon, um, to name a few, or the Beach Boys, um, it was not meant to sustain a musical. Um, at best, I think the genre holds up really well with something like Moving Out, which was uh, Billy Joel um, music, but it was only set to Twilight Thar choreography. There was no, there was no dialogue. There was no, there was a loose storyline, but there was nothing really um more to it more or less to it when they try to to take a catalog of songs and and make it into a a plot driven through line if you have someone in a beach boys musical named Rhonda, you know what's going to happen and it just it doesn't make for great compelling drama and that's just my two cents <laughs> <laughs> 
on it. Good songs, though. That's Mama right. Mia is fun. You know, before we wrap, I do have a question. I'm very curious. And it's on a personal basis. What are the Shakespearean names of your two daughters, your two dogs, and your cat? Of course. My oldest daughter is Miranda, named for uh, Miranda from The Tempest. Um, her younger sister is Amelia from um, Othello. And then my cat is named Juliet. My dogs are named Benedict from Much Do About Nothing and uh, Olivia from Twelfth Night because dogs are comedies and cats are tragedies. Uh, <laughs> and oh, and, and then of course, Toby uh, was my, my first doggy and he was named for Sir Toby Belch in Twelfth Night. And before I wrap, uh, wrap this up, I really want to thank the Library Foundation, I want to thank everybody who attended, I want to thank all the sponsors, but I also want to beg you, I know it's tempting to go see like the big shows, but there's so many great local theater companies, Center Rep, they need subscribers, Center Rep, Shotgun Players, California Shakespeare, um, Berkeley Rep, Berkeley Playhouse, go subscribe, ACT, please, 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 um, they, we need people back in the theater, we need live theater in this area so much. I couldn't agree more. Um, I hope they'll follow your lead and 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 start supporting these theater companies who are amazing. They need all right, a lot of help right now. So that was fantastic. I first of all, Rob, thank you for an absolutely outstanding presentation. Um, really, I I enjoyed every second of it, and I'm sure all the other viewers did as well. So I wish you all the best, as all of us do, in your next the next chapter. And I hope you do get deeply involved in theater and take on some of those projects you've been thinking about. Um, so um, thanks again so very much uh, for being here to this evening. I uh, also um, want to um, thank all of you wonderful folks for joining us tonight. And I do want to backtrack a little bit and thank two people, um, or our bestseller sponsors, and two families that are just terrific people. I forgot to acknowledge Kathleen and John Odney and Laurie and Greg Tempo. So thank you so much for your support of tonight's event. Um, for those of you that have registered for this event, you'll receive a link for the recorded video of Rob's outstanding presentation on YouTube and copies of the slides uh, that Rob presented. And you'll be entered in to win two tickets to the headliner of your choice with our new series at the Leisure Center. Um, uh, I hope you enjoyed tonight's performance. And look forward, um, we invite you all to make a donation to the Library Foundation on the website or in the um, link in the chat box. Your gift will truly make a difference. Um, we invite you to return next from the live from the library uh, program, The Bounty, presented by Mark Jordan. For more information, go to the Library Foundation website. Thanks again for attending and good night, everyone. <laughs>